Today, our guest is the writer Adam Higginbotham, author of Midnight in Chernobyl, which tells the story of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster of 1986. Introducing him today will be Andrew Marshall, a friend of the author and vice president at the Atlantic Council. Higginbotham's writing masterfully weaves together the history and science of the science of the nuclear age with personal stories of the men and women who made their lives in Pripyat. Written over more than a decade, Higginbotham's work has been called A Triumph of Investigative Reportage by the author Hampton Sides. Please help me welcome Adam Higginbotham to Politics and Prose. There. Is that working? Yes, that's working. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Welcome to Politics and Prose. It's um, great to be here today with my friend Adam to talk about his outstanding book, uh, Midnight in Chernobyl. It's a really gripping story of a horrific nuclear accident that took place in 1986. Uh, we're going to talk for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to open for questions. Uh, and I'm sure looking at the audience, there will be a number of questions. I see some friends and some experts in the audience. Um, Adam, this is a, a really tremendous book. It's um, it's a thriller in many respects. It's a very dramatic story. It's a story about a terrible explosion. It's a story about human failure, political failure. It's about heroism. It's about the people who struggle to deal with this. What was the what was it that drew you to this story? Which element was it that brought you into the story in the first place? Um, is this? Can you hear me through this? Is this? Is that, um, well, I. Feel, I, I Started with a story in back in 2006 as a reporter on assignment for the Observer magazine in London. And um, at that point, I just wanted to kind of reconstruct the story um, in a way that I hadn't seen done before, because I'd recently read Walter Lord's A Night to Remember about the sinking of the Titanic. Um, and I just thought that it seemed in theory that this was, uh, you know, a story that, that could be done better justice than it had been in existing writing by being reconstructed in that way, by going back and finding, as Lord did, um, eyewitnesses and finding out what really happened. Um, but then when I first went to Moscow, it, uh, almost exactly 13 years ago this month, um, and began talking to these men and women, I realized that everything that I'd read about it before had kind of not suggested the details of the story and the reality that I was discovering. And the first thing was that, because I was 17 when it happened, um, and I realized that I'd been just as much a victim of Western propaganda uh, about the Soviet Union as, as anybody in the Soviet Union had been, you know, the other way around. And that what I was expecting was to meet a lot of kind of faceless, gray victims of the socialist experiment. But the people I talked to were like, you know, were real people who were clearly like me. And they'd had, uh, you know, they'd had aims and aspirations and hopes and fallibilities just like I had. And then... I also started finding out that there were things that just I hadn't read about anywhere that kind of revealed that there was much more to the story than than I'd suspected. And that specifically, there was one guy who was a nuclear physicist named Venyamin Perinichnikov, who I met in Kiev. Um, and when I was reporting the Observer story, I asked everybody I met the same question at one point or another, which was, what was the most frightening moment of this experience for you? And of course, anybody was there at the time, I expected them to say, well, there was this huge explosion and I thought I was going to die. And, and then afterwards, there was radiation release. And Prinichnikov didn't say that. What he said was, hmm, the most frightening moment for me. Well, I think that was probably around May the 5th when we began to suspect that there was going to be another second, much, much larger explosion. And we were all going to die. And so were people for hundreds of meters in every direction. I was like, what? what? What are you talking about? I, 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 how do I not know about this? And so that was that was the, the one thing that really started me on the kind of route to reporting it out. And it's been 13 years in the making. Uh, yes, it has. <laughs> I mean, not constantly. I was doing some other things for the first seven or eight years of that. But for the last four years, I've just been working on this. So as you say, the 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 central uh, incident around which the, the book revolves is this massive explosion. And for me, I can say that is the most shocking and horrifying part of the book. It's on page 88. Uh, and um, <laughs> it's, it's pretty horrifying. And it's a big explosion. And um, you've already, at that point in the book, foreshadowed where it comes from and, and, and what it results from. What I don't mean in terms of nuclear physics, but what's the cause of that explosion? What lies behind that explosion? 
Well, the kind of the, the long tail of the explosion is the kind of the culture of secrecy and lies of the Soviet Union, because it was like, you know, the make, it, it was 20 years in the making, the explosion. And eventually the, the, the Prime Minister Rishkov, um, you know, said in the Politburo meeting in, in July, the July following the explosion, that, you know, this explosion was, this accident was always going to happen somewhere. It just wasn't necessarily going to happen in Chernobyl, but it was going to happen at one of these reactors in some place at some time. Um, but the proximate cause was a combination of, of this terrible series of design faults that the designers of the reactor had known about almost since it was created, um, but hadn't really warned anyone. And they kind of covered most of them up and certainly hadn't done anything to address them. Um, and the one specific thing, because there's a whole, there's like maybe six or seven major faults. Um, and the, the staff made a series of mistakes that brought all of these faults into this kind of terrible alignment, like the kind of turning of a combination on a safe. Um, and the final one, the most telling one, was that the, there was a, a fault in the way that the control rods worked. So that the control rods which you would introduce into the reactor at the point of shutdown or emergency shutdown to, turn the, to effectively turn the whole thing off. Briefly, for a few seconds, would instead of completely reducing power, would increase power. So it was analogous to, to stamping on the brakes of a speeding car, and instead of the brakes stopping the car, suddenly speeding it up. And that was what precipitated the explosion. Yeah, and there is that horrible moment when, as you say, a number of things have gone wrong. Things are already very, 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 very bad. <laughs> and they go to do the thing that yeah. they think, well, okay, that's what we have to do, and that will bring this to an end. And it does. Yeah. <laughs> but it brings it to an end with a, with a horrifying explosion, um, which is very dramatically described. Um, it, it, it should be said that you, you talked about the, your experience of going to first report on this and meeting the people, hearing the human stories, which is very often the case as, as, a, as a journalist. The really interesting thing is that you you start to have a sense, gosh, these are real people with real lives. Yeah. This 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 place, um, Chernobyl, or Pripyat, which is near Chernobyl, which we sort of have this idea now, and, and indeed it's not a terrific place clearly now, but we have this idea of so, it being... Actually, it's a, it's a quite lovely place now. It's rather beautiful, and especially rather in the uns, summer. And unspoiled, yes. Well... <clears throat> unspoiled by human hands lately. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because you've been there and you have seen what it looks like. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what you're talking about is is that uh, that that when it was still populated before 1986, it was it was like a nice place to live. But this this is re this was really something else that I discovered that hadn't been written about before. Um, when I began reporting in 2006, I, I you know what I became aware of was the fact that this had been. This kind of, it was a great community. It was unlike other cities in the Soviet Union. It was this kind of prize posting for Soviet nuclear scientists and energy workers for exactly that reason. It was kind of, it was this beautiful, newly built town with these big apartments beside a river. There was a yacht club, discos at weekends, a beauty parlor, a scuba diving club. They had their soccer team, you know, and, and because it was supervised by the Ministry of Energy, it was better supplied and resourced than other towns in the USSR. So... You could buy like 16 varieties of sausage in the delicatessen and fresh cucumbers. And, you know, one thing that was a really rare delicacy, which was fresh tomatoes. Um, and it was important to me when I was writing the book and reporting the book to be able to get across exactly n not merely what had happened on the night of the accident, but what life was like in this town beforehand and therefore what people had really lost. In addition to, you know, the health effects they had kind of lost this, you know, this wonderful experience of living in this, you know, city of the future. And, and what was it like to talk to these people to get their stories uh, about what had happened? This, this was something about which there was enormous secrecy at the time and f for some some period afterwards. How happy, how, how happy to talk, how easy was it to get people to talk to you about what had happened? It really varied depending mm -hmm. on who they were. Um, you know, there were some former workers in the nuclear industry who still felt bound by these oaths of secrecy they'd taken to this empire that had ceased to exist, you know, back in 1991. And they would say, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't possibly tell you about that work I did on the, those nuclear submarines because that's, that's secret. Yeah. Um, and there were other people I met who, you know, nobody had ever spoken to before because they had these, you know, these relatively unimportant positions in the you know, administration of the city, they, you know, like the bookkeepers or the, 
um, administrators like that. And they were, they were only too happy to talk to me because nobody had ever told their stories before. And then there were other people that you would expect, you'd obviously expect not to want to talk to me, like KGB officers. <laughs> but it turned out that uh, the Ukrainian KGB has got a kind of, um, you know, former members of the Ukrainian KGB association, which is headed by a former Ukrainian general. Um, and so me and my fixer got in touch with him and had a word with him. And he gave a lot of his former officers the instruction <laughs> that they should talk to me. Now, and some of those guys, you know, they would... I, because I was talking to almost all of these people through translators, and, and one of these former KGB officers I was talking to, um, I just, halfway through the interview, I, I stopped and I said to the translator, "Look, can you, can, you're not, you know, can, please help me out here. You, you, you're really not doing a very good job here because you're not finishing a single sentence. I'm, I'm not hearing. There is no object to any of the sentences you're repeating to me, and I'm not getting any information out of this." And he was like. Well, no, I'm just translating exactly what he's saying. And the guy was deliberately, you know, he'd spent his whole life talking like this and talked around and around and around for an hour and a half without saying a single thing. You're hearing a Washington audience laugh about that, I suspect, <laughs> for a number of different reasons. Uh, and indeed, many people in the audience, I suspect, are familiar with that style and uh, approach to discussion. I can imagine. Um, uh, and indeed, you, you had some, some useful conversations and some... Um, some help from from people in Washington to work on this as well, I think. Uh, yes, I did. Um, uh, Christian Osterman from the Wilson Center was very helpful in putting me in touch with people who translated documents and indeed in finding documents uh, that prove central to the narrative. Right. Um, Christian, I think, is not here at the moment, but a former colleague of mine who works on archive work around uh, former Soviet Union, apart from anything else. Um, the Soviet Union, and you've, you've called it, I think, a system a system based on lies. Uh, the Soviet Union, as was, Gorbachev was in, relatively newly in power and struggled to deal with this, struggled uh, very badly to deal with this. It took uh, the system a long time to accept what had happened. It took a long time for that information to spread. It took a long time for people to accept the causes and nature. Do you want to talk a little about how they struggled and, and, and in the end, how they were able to deal with talking about this? Because they did, in the end, talk about this. They did talk about it, although not all of it in public. I mean, um, I mean, to this day, Gorbachev insists that he was completely, he was in favour of complete openness about what had happened from the minute it happened. Um, but this is not really supported by the available evidence. Um, the principal piece of which is that they, the explosion happened at around 1.30 in the morning on, on Saturday morning, and Gorbachev <laughs> says in his memoirs that he, um, or one of his many memoirs, he says that he called uh, an emergency Politburo meeting. This emergency Politburo meeting was so, is such an emergency that it took place at 10.30 on Monday morning. Um, and then in this meeting, they had a conversation about whether or what and whether they should release any information to the public about this. And they ended up releasing a three-line statement that said that there had been an accident. But they waited until 8 o'clock that night to do that and then issued that statement through TASS. Um, and it was clearly not an open and revealing statement. They didn't mention radioactive releases for a start. Um, so I think it was that, you know, no, I think I say in the book that no matter what Gorbachev's intentions, it turned out that the old ways were the best. And as a communications professional, I was um, <laughs> uh, I'm not wholly surprised by that journey of a message, uh, I should say. But I was also um, we were talking at breakfast this morning. You were talking about how a year later they effectively tried to put together a communications plan over how they had dealt with this and what a terrific job they'd done. Do you want to talk yes, a they did. about they, that? They, one of the, the documents I came across that I, I hadn't been aware of before was uh, a report to the Politburo from the head of uh, Gostel Radio, I think, which is the, you know, the head of state propaganda for TV and radio, who produced what is essentially, a, you'll know the term, but it's like a communications brief in which he suggested... Um, as the first anniversary of the accident was coming up, and there was going to be a lot of chatter about this in the media globally and within the Soviet Union, um, that they needed to prepare a strategy for it. And he, he had you know, a long list of maybe eight or ten different suggestions of TV and radio programs, which included one that was called 
pallets of the spring marketplace, which suggested sending a TV camera crew down to uh, the central fruit and vegetable market in Kiev and reporting on how excellent and nutritious all the fruit and vegetables were and passing a Geiger counter over the food to demonstrate how clean and nice it was. I mean, one should remember when all is said and done, this is a, a, a somber and terrible event in which many died um, and where, yes, there was cynical behaviour of the sort you've talked about, but there were also, and, and, and the book shows this, there are, there are many tremendous acts of heroism. A lot of the book is about um, the bravery of the men and women in, in, in many different functions, whether in the emergency services, first responders, um, the military, uh, who behave with really outstanding heroism. Uh, and and that, that's one of the things I think that lifts the book from being um, merely the description of a disaster right. to something that's about the attempts of people to deal with this. Did you come out of the book with a particular individual who was stood out above those as a, a hero figure? Well, there's... There's two principal characters um, because I think that a lot of the kind of the heroism of the firefighters and, and the first responders is, as you know, has been reported before. I mean, not least by um, Pravda because it took them a while, but the Soviet authorities eventually fixed on a good angle to report the story from, and that was what they chose was to report the yeah. acts of the firefighters. But to me, there were the two people. One was. Um, this woman, Maria Pritsenko, who was the chief architect of Pripyat before the accident, and she's really like the kind of unsinkable Molly Brown of the story. Um, you know, she presided over the, the construction of the town and the city, and then had to, to organize the evacuation of all of these people. And they, they evacuated 27,500 people in three hours, which is this kind of remarkable achievement. Uh, that probably wouldn't be worked that way if, if they'd not been in a centrally planned economy. Um, but then, you know, very tragically and, and to me movingly, she also has to preside over organising the permanent fencing off of this city from the outside world in conjunction with the, with the, the KGB. Um, and so she's one of the characters. Uh, and you met her? <clears throat> oh, yeah. She's, she's, without introducing any spoilers, she's, she's definitely still around. Tell us a little bit about meeting her. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, Your that, journey to meet her and oh, I see. Oh, just that uh, that I I I had read a reference to her, and I'm not even sure that she was named in an old Prada clip um, from the time from '86, and um, and I really wanted to find this, you know, this this unnamed architect, and so in an interview with the deputy mayor of Pripyat, I happened to say at one point, I said, well, so I, I've been. I've been looking for this this female architect, who's the chief architect of the town. Um, I, you know, I wonder if you know anybody who would be able to, to tell me where she is. And he said, "Oh yes, well she's my next door neighbour. I'll, I'll I'll give you her phone number." Because it turns out, you know, in Soviet society, a lot of people would get you you would be housed in in the same building as all the people you work with. So if I was going to your house, you'd be in the same apartment building as all the other people that worked at the Atlantic Council. So everybody worked on the Pripyat Ispolkom, you know, is, is remain next door neighbours. Um, but I said, you know, I said to the translator on the way to the meeting, I said, uh, you know, Alex, I, I've just got this woman's telephone number. I don't know anything about her at all. I saw passing mention of her in this clip from, from years ago. Uh, it, this whole thing could be over in 10 minutes. It could be totally uninformative. Bit of a fishing expedition. You know, we'll probably be out of there in time for lunch. And six hours later, uh, we got, you know, halfway through talking about the things that Maria knew about what had happened because nobody had ever really interviewed her before. Um, and she's she's kind of still, she's still teaching, actually, design at the Salvador Dali Institute in Kiev. And there's a, um, another person uh, whose heroism you particularly... Oh, well, the, 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 other, the other person is um, Alexander Yevchenko, uh, who, with his wife Natalia, is, is one of the characters who, whose story runs all the way through the book. Um, and you know, he he is more of an interesting character because he, you know, he his experience reflects that of a much more ordinary individual in the Soviet Union who did not kind of scale heights of enormous heroism. But but what he did on the night of the accident, among other things, uh, in saving his colleagues, uh, was at one point he joined three other men who were sent to try to establish whether or not the control rods had fully descended into the reactor. Uh, and of course, there were no control rods by the time they were sent to do this. But they, they 
they attempt to get into the central hall to see what's happened. And there is this enormous airlock door which blocks the entrance to the central hall, which was made of concrete and steel. And, you know, in normal use, is supposed to be perfectly balanced so that you can uh, open it easily and close it easily. But it had been moved off its hinges and the, the mechanism had been broken. So they went in to look and he had to stand with his back against the door to hold it open so that they wouldn't get shut into the central hall and die. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things that it was most remarkable about what he did, I think. And I think there was a section that you thought you might read about oh, yes. him. Yeah, yeah. I'll hold the microphone while you uh, get yourself prepared. I'm only reading one extract. Just a couple of chapters or so. <laughs> No plans for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> Thanks. Keep, keep, the keep the microphone up. Keep the microphone up? Yeah. Well, I must also. Ah, uh, age comes to us all. Yeah. I should have prepared better for this. Right. Upstairs, inside the windowless senior engineer's room on level 12.5, Alexander Yevchenko was engulfed in dust, steam, and darkness. From beyond the shattered doorway came a terrible hissing sound. He groped along his desk for the telephone, connecting with him with control room four, but the line was dead. Then someone from control room three rang through with a command, bring stretchers immediately. Yevchenko gathered a stretcher and ran downstairs toward Mark 10, but before he could reach the control room, he was stopped by a dazed figure his clothes blackened, his face bloody and unrecognisable. Only when he spoke did Yevchenko realise it was his friend, the coolant pump operator, Viktor Degtarenko. He said that he had come from near his station and there were others still there who needed help. Probing the humid darkness with a flashlight, Yevchenko came upon a second operator on the other side of a pile of wreckage, still able to stand but filthy, wet and grotesquely scalded by escaping steam. He was quivering with shock, but waved Yevchenko away. I'm all right, he said. Help Kademchuk. He's in the pump room. Then Yevchenko saw his colleague Yuri Tregub emerging from the gloom. Tregub had been sent from control room number four to manually turn on the taps of the emergency high-pressure coolant system and flood the reactor core with water. Knowing this task would require at least two men, Yevchenko told the injured pump operator where to go to get help and accompanied Tregub toward the coolant tanks. Finding the nearest entrance blocked by rubble, they went down two flights of stairs and immediately found themselves knee-deep in water. The door to the hall was jammed shut, but through a narrow gap, the two men glimpsed inside. Everything was in ruins. The gigantic steel water tanks had been torn apart like wet cardboard, and above the wreckage, where the, <clears throat> where the walls and ceiling of the hall should have been, they could see only stars. They were staring into empty space. The bowels of the benighted station were lit by moonlight. The two men turned into the ground level transport corridor and reeled outside into the night. Standing no more than 50 metres away from the reactor, Tregub and Yevchenko were among the first to comprehend what had happened to Unit 4. It was a terrifying, apocalyptic sight. The roof of the reactor hall was gone, and the right-hand wall had been almost completely demolished by the force of the explosion. Half of the cooling circuit had simply disappeared. On the left, the water tanks and pipework that had once fed the main circulation pumps dangled in mid-air. Yevchenko knew at that moment that Valery Kodemchuk was certainly dead. The spot where he had been standing lay beneath a steaming pile of rubble lit by flashes from the severed ends of 6,000 volt cables as thick as a man's arm, swaying and shorting on everything they touched, showering the wreckage with sparks. And from somewhere in the heart of the tangled mass of rebar and shattered concrete, from deep inside the ruins of Unit 4, where the reactor was supposed to be, Alexander Yevchenko could see something more frightening still, a shimmering pillar of ethereal blue-white light reaching straight up into the night sky, disappearing into infinity. Delicate and strange, and encircled by a flickering spectrum of colours conjured by flames from within the burning building, and superheated chunks of metal and machinery, the beautiful phosphorescence transfixed Yevchenko for a few seconds. Then Tregub yanked him back around the corner and out of immediate danger, 
the phenomenon that had entranced the young engineer was created by the radioactive ionization of air and was an almost certain sign of an unshielded nuclear reactor open to the atmosphere. Yeah, a horrifying moment. And um, a moment when they must have started to realise also, I mean, how many minutes can a human being remain around that stuff? Uh, very well, the guys the that went out onto the ledge, you know, didn't last long. Right. And you talk in the book about how the rescue workers have to time their exposure if they're going to move stuff or lift stuff or right. save people exactly. to minutes. Or seconds. Yeah. Or seconds, yeah. Um, just before we go to questions, this this is a, a shift in your writing, I know, from knowing you for a while. Um, and briefly earlier when you talked about Pravda, I wasn't sure if you'd said Prada. Um, <laughs> the first part of your writing career was actually around a very different set of topics, which was rock and roll. And this, this was a long time ago. This was a long time ago. Um, uh, but you worked in that field. You had great distinction. You interviewed and met many of the great figures in the field. What happened? What happened, man? What, what, what happened to why, the... Why, why did I eventually bow out? Why, why, why did you desert rock and roll for um, nuclear disaster? What happened? Uh... Well, the lifestyle began to get to me for a start. Um, uh, but I think the, the part of the answer is that, you know, I was always after the, I was always following the stories. And eventually, writing about rock music, you run out of stories because they're, frankly, pretty similar. Um, but also, I, you know, I eventually interviewed the people who tell the ultimate versions of all of those stories. And, you know, I also met my heroes. So in pretty quick succession, I interviewed Al Green and then I met and interviewed Keith Richards. Um, and after I'd interviewed Keith Richards, who was just brilliant and like everything that you would want him to be. I mean, whatever the real Keith Richards is like, he was really brilliant at being Keith Richards for like an hour and a half. Uh, and just wonderful to interview and absolutely charming. And when I asked him if, uh, if he could explain to me what a ratchet knife was, reached into the waistband of his jeans and flicked this knife out into my face and then explained to me exactly how you use it. He went like this, he had the, which was still very sharp. And he went like this, he went, see what you do is if, you, if somebody comes up to you and you're getting into trouble, what you do is you get your knife like this and you slash them across the forehead like this and then the blood runs into their eyes and they can't see what's going on. Then you kick them in the balls and you run as fast as you can. <laughs> And after I'd interviewed him, I just thought, well, there's no point anymore. I can't. <laughs> and somehow it seems a short hop from Keith Richards to Chernobyl. Well, ironically, his favourite drink at that point in his life was the nuclear waste, which was a tumbler filled with ice, filled almost to the brim with vodka, and then topped off with a little bit of orange soda. <laughs> Look disgusting. I think that's an appropriate point to <laughs> head towards questions, which I hope will be about um, the book rather than about Keith. Keith. <laughs> and we have the first question. Who are... <laughs> Andrew? Thank you. Um, I'm Rob Litvak from the Wilson Center. I work with Christian Osterman, so I'm glad you were able to uh, use the wonderful archival resources we have at the Wilson Center. I mean, it's a great resource, it's all online, at popularly priced at free, so. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, and hopefully we're gonna post some documents that I found. That, that'd, be one, that'd be wonderful. Um, uh, I was in Moscow when Chernobyl happened. It was a very weird thing, uh, precisely what you recounted, because I was on the, uh, you know, um, the Academy of Science Exchange, kind of living, living there, and, uh, the information came from BBC and, dip and, and embassies that said that the prevailing winds weren't prevailing, so no panic. But you could see, that, like at the Kievsky Vauxhall, you know, like just streams of people coming in, that something big uh, had happened. And as I recall, that was the same month that the Americans bombed uh, Gaddafi. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It was sort of yeah. A, it was around sort of, the same time. It, yeah. was, it was sort of a, a kind of a weird time. But everyone was talking about, uh, you know, glasnost and everything. So, so it was sort of an interesting test case. Now, your book, obviously, uh, which I look forward to reading, um, uh, t touches on sort of how it was debated in the Soviet Soviet Union and uh, the then Soviet Union. I have an inter uh, kind of a, a different vector, and I'd just be interested in your take on, you know, your book in terms of the debate we're having now about the future of nuclear power, because, <laughs> you know, in terms of scalable, low-carbon energy, mm -hmm. uh, it's got to be in the mix for the next couple decades till I think get to so, something yeah. else. And yet people think nuclear and they think Chernobyl, Fukushima. I mean, when Fukushima happened, you know, th three things that no one thought could ever happen, you know, tsunami, 
tidal wave <laughs> and, and uh, you know, kind of earthquake. I mean, it's, it's uh, um, uh, the Germans checked out of nuclear energy at that point. So I'd just be interested in kind of, uh, does your book address at all like future of nuclear energy or do it, you have views on that? Yeah, it, it does a little yeah. bit at the end because, you know, when I embarked on this, I was pretty anxious not to, you know, fall into the trap of making it some treatise about, you know, how terrible nuclear energy is because I just, mm -hmm. I'm really not convinced that's the case. I mean, in its most simplistic terms, I think that um, you know, the Chernobyl accident was a was a kind of historical one-off, and this kind of accident on this scale could uh, really only have happened with this design of reactor in a society like the Soviet Union, you know, in 1986 or you know in 1990. Or, um, but so so I I think that that the most simplistic way of looking at it is to say you know saying that this means that Chernobyl disaster means that you should no longer use nuclear power of any kind is like saying that because the Titanic sank you should no longer travel by the ocean liner you know the technology has moved on a lot and there is now a fourth generation of nuclear reactor which you know in theory at least avoids all of the problems uh, of this reactor of the Three Mile Island reactor of the Fukushima reactor all of which are old designs all of which originated with the needs of, of weapons production, you know, they, all the designs originated with, with reactors that were principally designed to manufacture plutonium and then were turned over to electricity generation because that was the reactor design that most people were using at the time. And the fourth generation ones, you know, are, are in theory, are much safer, they have passive safety systems and they produce far less uh, radioactive waste. So I think that the, if there is a future in it, it's those. Thank you. I wondered about the um, the ongoing nature of this, and now that it's uh, one cesium strontium half life later, you know the, the, they say that maybe in twenty two eighty six when that stuff's down to less than point one percent, um, what what's the long term sort of cleanup for Chernobyl? Like, did the architect when when you talk to her say, oh yeah, I expected that fence that keeps people out to last for a hundred years, and then somebody when I'm dead will come up with the plan for the next 200 or or how did they how did they think of like the long term for this isolation of the of you mean the how did they think of it at the time back in 86 or well how how has that thought evolved over time like then then and and now i mean they put the new containment over the right old sarcophagus to That's disassemble a, the, the reactor they, they cover the we, we should expect or do you want to explain You've interviewed these people. <laughs> you go ahead. It's, it's your job. Well, so, they, so in order to cover up the reactor that was leaking radioactivity into the environment, they built this thing that they called the sarcophagus, which was essentially a giant steel and concrete tent over the top of the remains of the reactor. Um, but they put it up very quickly, and they had to do it, a lot of it, by remote control. So 10 years later, they discovered this was likely to fall down. Um, so they began work on an international project to build a cover over the cover uh, which has only just been completed, which is called the new safe confinement, um, which is supposed to make it safe for another hundred years. Um, but you talk about the the about Maria Protsenko uh, fencing the place off. You know, she told herself that they were only doing this to keep looters out because she really wanted wow. to return to the town. You know, this had been you know an important part of her life's work, and she loved living there. Um, so. When the KGB major came and said, Maria, I need you to show me on the map where the sewers are. Uh, let's find some places to, to put these fence posts in. She was like, that's fine. You know, we'll be back in by Christmas. Um, she certainly wasn't expecting never, ever to come back. I was up until 3 o'clock last night reading your book. And I was almost late to this reading because I was still reading your book. So I, I, I've just gotten to the part where they're worried about the second explosion. Right. And my eyebrows are trying to climb right off my face. <laughs> yes, And I'm yes. reading little bits to my wife. So first, well told. It's oh, an thank amazing you. story, an amazing book. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank so a very personal question. Well, I'm sorry question. I kept you up. Hmm? What's that? <laughs> I didn't catch that. Oh, I'm sorry I kept you awake. Uh, you did. <laughs> that, that's fine. So a personal question. So at the time, I was 19. I was a college student, and I was in Wales. And I oh, remember yeah. a few days after the accident, I was touring castles in the countryside along with a bus group of other college students. 
And I vaguely me remember having thought at the time, maybe this isn't such a good idea to be walking outside in the rain after this accident out in Wales. And I've never been able to get a clear idea of how much radiation I might have been exposed to. Can you say something about that? Uh, well, that's part of the problem is that is that at this point, you won't be able to. Unless I think the one very reliable um, source of that kind of analysis I understand is that uh, if you take one of your bones and grind it up and have that analyzed, you can determine your strontium exposure. Okay, thanks. <laughs> that's, that's very reassuring. Um, <coughs> and teeth is another good one. Okay. So, right. Oh, and you can, you can have... Yeah, actually, you can. You're right, because you can go through... Uh, a whole body uh, gamma dosimeter, which will do a similar thing. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty, at this point, and this is a, a lot of the problem in the territories that were, that were very thickly blanketed with radiation in the aftermath of the accident, is that it's very hard to tell at this point, you know, what your exposure was and what the impact on your health is due to that exposure rather than all the other things that might be having an effect on your health over that time. Okay, well, that's a comforting answer, but thank you. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Andriy Trochimchuk. I uh, arrived to the United States from Ukraine three months ago, staying at Buffalo at UB, but uh, arriving to Washington yesterday to attend uh, a lecture at the Institute of uh, World Politics about sanctions. Yeah, and uh, accidentally, my uh, friend uh, uh, found that uh, it will be the uh, presentation today. So I did not have a chance to read the book. But from what you explained, because I, I, I was in Ukraine at that time, so uh -huh. it's, it's pretty uh, worth, yeah? But my question is, uh, uh, have you heard about that project called Duga? Oh yes, the yeah. the the over the over the horizon yeah. radar, yeah. Yeah. which Could is also in the exclusion zone around the reactor. Yeah, because uh, uh, no, I do not know, but is, uh, there is discussion uh, in Ukraine that it projects Duga since it has been finally found uh, unrealistic, was one of the reason to stimulate this disaster in Chernobyl because oh. it's close to that area, and after that area became irradiated. It was a, a natural decision to close that project, mm -hmm. but the uh, uh, the reason for closing was was another. Could you comment this? Please? The, so this is a this is a theory um, that's actually the subject of a documentary film I think called The Russian yeah, Woodpecker, yeah. right? Uh, which is that the 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 Chernobyl accident was was deliberately because I haven't seen this documentary, but I understand that it's the the idea behind the film is that. The Chernobyl disaster was deliberately caused by people who had built this massive over the over the horizon radar installation a few kilometers from the reactor and discovered that it was this colossal boondoggle and it was a giant waste of money and they were going to get in deep trouble with their superiors when they found out that it didn't work. So in order to uh, save their careers and possibly their lives, they um, they brought about this accident, which contaminated such a vast area that it included this over the radar, over the horizon radar installation, causing everybody to be evacuated so their superiors would never discover that it didn't work. I think that's the theory. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but I haven't seen the documentary, so. <laughs> No, oh, but uh, yeah, there is, uh, uh, you know, the reason for that documentary was it was the, the real uh, nodes uh, which has been found yeah. between the, uh, the uh, group of scientists and the member, the highest level of the member of the this communist party, you know. Uh, and uh, there are reports from the people who was working at uh, Chernobyl nuclear yeah. uh, station that there is some uh, uh, deviation from the normal functioning, what we're supposed to do. And the signal was just keep, continue this, nothing will happen, you know. Oh, and wow. it was the reason for that documentary and right. the people who investigate this. But my question, did uh, you did not mention this in your book. I didn't mention it because I never came across any evidence of that myself. Uh, and nobody ever mentioned it to there me. There is in Wikipedia, uh, there is a lot of right. information. You, you could read right. it. But no, so so I was aware of the documentary because it was it came out while I was researching the book. But I never I never spoke to any nuclear engineers who worked at the plant or anybody who investigated it who mentioned that to me. But no, I, I do know, I've, I've read about it, definitely. Thank you. 
So I'm interested to take you back to some of the people that you spoke with in your interviews. Uh -huh. um, those who worked either at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant or in close proximity to it, a lot of them um, had a, pardon the pun, a, you know, a searing experience. Um, yeah. Were they, uh, maybe you could comment, I suppose they were arranged, but were they still feeling positively about nuclear power? Would they comment on this? Did oh, yeah, absolutely. Disillusioned? How, how did they talk about that experience? I think, I mean, I'm not sure how accurately I could generalize, but my memory of it is that the majority of the people that worked in the nuclear industry who worked at the plant remained, for all their experience, definitely in support of nuclear power afterwards. And, and they were, uh, you know, and actually some continue to work in the nuclear industry now. So there's this one character, um, Boris Stolyachuk, who was in the control room on the night of the accident. Um, and he ended up running, uh, he was appointed as the acting head of Ukraine's nuclear safety um, agency pretty recently. So no, I mean, they, they definitely, the majority of them did definitely support it. That, that seems on the face of it fairly extraordinary. Well, they were of the opinion that, that you know, uh, it was a badly designed reactor and they'd been lied to and there's nothing intrinsically wrong with nuclear power. Fascinating. So there's um, an organization called uh, Children of Chernobyl. It, um, um, it is um, set up to help address, I think, some of the you know, health issues that right. resulted from this. So I was curious if you m ran into them or know anything about them. And then in the larger picture, you know, uh, efforts to, you know, treat, uh, you know, the severe radiation, you know, problems that, you know, people suffered. And, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, you're seeing, you know, very high cancer rates, you know, within Ukraine in the immediate areas. And, you know, uh, what, how is that being addressed? at all well you know. the the problem with that and the and the the problem with the um the you know operations like children's chernobyl is is that actually because of the i mean partly because of the cover-up and the attempt to conceal uh the information about people's health that they, the soviet government did collect in the immediate aftermath of the, the accident but also because of the poor health of people in the area generally speaking um it's actually very hard to kind of filter the signal from the noise and connect people's poor health directly to their radiation exposure in the wake of the accident. Um, and so I talk about this at the end of the book, that you know the official statistics are a lot lower, the official UN statistics, I'm not talking about the Soviet statistics, um, are a lot lower than you might expect. So uh, out of a population of 5 million people, uh, the projections were that 5,000 would die of cancers directly linked to the accident. And that's part of a wider number of 25,000 people across Europe who would suffer from other cancers that could directly be linked to the accident. But you can see that, you know, in a group of 5 million people, 5,000 people, you know, that's a tiny percentage. Um, and it's so it, it's just, it's really hard to make a direct connection between these things. Um, and, you know, the work that's being done by organizations like Children of Chernobyl, you know, is, is, as far as I can see, addressing just as much the kind of poor health and poverty that there is in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union and then the economic crises that have overtaken these countries subsequently, as it is about, you know, radiation from the accident. I think we have one more question. No? Okay. Well, um, thank you very much, Adam. Thank you. Um, thank you thank very you much, everybody. Midnight in Chernobyl.